From the Radio Cafe and the Kivira Coalition, you're listening to Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. Today we're going to be talking to a guy who transforms public and private land, like lawns and library and city hall land, into thriving ecosystems and food gardens. That's right after these brief announcements. This program is sponsored by the Agrarian Trust. Agrarian Trust is charting a new path forward for the land trust movement. They're advancing an innovative and robust model of land ownership in which agrarianism, social and environmental justice, community well-being, and the earth itself are all seen as fundamentally intertwined. They're doing this by helping regenerative farmers and ranchers to secure long-term affordable leases. That helps to strengthen local food systems and to transform community relationships to the land across the country. Visit agrariantrust.org to learn more. This program is sponsored by the Greenhorns. Listeners to Down to Earth might enjoy the newly released sixth edition of the New Farmer's Almanac, a literary miscellany written by and for working agrarians. This year's volume is titled Adjustments and Accommodations, and it's full of essays, poetry, and images that explore how people are facing challenges and uncertainties on the land. Learn more and order your copy at greenhorns.org. I'd like now to welcome Eric Olson. He is a professional regenerative landscape designer. He's the owner of Permaculture Artisans, and he's author of the new book, The Regenerative Landscaper, published by Synergetic Press right here in Santa Fe. Welcome. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. So you're doing something that's so exciting. I mean, I read as much as I could have of this, this wonderful book called The Regenerative Landscaper, you are doing for landscaping what many of our our listeners and friends do with regenerative agriculture, and that is making regenerative landscapes. How did first of all, how did you get into this work? Uh, well, when I was nineteen, I wasn't really on the college path. I was more on the path of I, w- I had a love for nature and kind of got turned on through learning about some of the kind of terrible things happening in the world with genetic engineering, Monsanto Terminator seed technology, things like that. And working with uh, some of my friends at the time, we created an organization called Planting Earth Activation, and we gave away free gardens to people in exchange for saving seed from the garden as a goal to create a, a heirloom open pollinated seed bank in our community. So that's kind of what got me going was can we provide solutions to corporate agriculture, bio-colonial takeover, essentially, through trade agreements and, and all that. That's what got me going. And from there, it was a quick jump into permaculture design. And the rest is history. So when we talk about um, regenerative, we have to talk about sort of its opposite, like, you know, whether it's industrial agriculture or industrial landscaping. I mean, what does industrial extractive landscaping look like? Well, here in the United States, there are 40 million acres of lawn. And to water those lawns, just in the U.S., it's 200,000 trillion gallons of water per year. And you'll find a lot of these... 200,000 num- trillion. You're getting into like, what, quintillion? <laughs> like- yeah, these numbers, I, I, it's hard to even wrap your mind around yeah. how big these numbers are. In fact, there's more herbicides and pesticides being used by homeowners caring for their landscapes in the United States than industrial agriculture in the United States. So if we're thinking about transforming land use on a massive scale, we often talk about agriculture and we don't often talk about landscape, which is the scale. If you put all of our landscapes together across the country and across the world is, is quite gigantic. So this is an area that has a lot of potential for shifting the industry to bring about positive change in in very meaningful and effective ways. As well with the landscape industry, you, you'll see an approach of you know drain all the water away. So you you get um, pipe and pavement um, and drain inlets. You get essentially a approach to land use that doesn't honor um, the ecosystem. I mean, it's striking to me that so much of suburbia is built on what had once been arable farmland, as well as strip malls, as well as sort of corporate high rises outside the beltway of a lot of cities and things like that. That's really good land that's not going to 
agriculture or really other ecosystem service purposes in a lot of in a lot of instances yeah our development processes haven't honored the landscape for at least 150 years and now we start to see a shift in the way people approach municipalities approach development because they are forced to do it due to droughts and fires and kind of a new scale of climate catastrophe that is really forcing the hand of um, developers to change the way we think about things. But currently we're in a situation where we are inheriting in a lot of our municipalities and a lot of our suburbs, very devastating systems to the landscape, to the ecosystem as a whole. You live in Sonoma County, California, and one of the things that's going on that's really exciting there is some of these municipalities are going all in on regeneration, including doing landscaping in their, what, city hall, schools, things like that? Yeah, and that I think really is a testament to not only on the ground landscape transformation, but also how we transform our political, local, our local governments and our decision makers. And so for the past 25 plus years in Sonoma County where I live, there's been an amazing community of folks that have that have been, uh, you know, electing uh, progressive minded folks, ecologically minded people, people who have science backgrounds in ecology and permaculture certificates are getting elected to school boards and city councils and board of supervisors. And when we address issues in the community, such as water scarcity or such as wildfire, often it's people who have an ecological lens that can provide a lot of incredible solutions. So we've been really fortunate through the city of Sebastopol and Petaluma to have been two real champions of this, uh, mostly working with an organization called Daily Acts Organization, who get these municipal contracts, who've done the work, the background work to talk to decision makers, planning department directors and public works folks. And you know, you really have to bring all the stakeholders to the table. But then the result is, that we then can design and build edible forest gardens around city halls, edible forest gardens around landscapes, boys and girls clubs, and schools. I was part of, with the Daily Acts organization, um, designing and, and building the very first public food forest in California, in Northern California, at the Kavanaugh Center in Petaluma. And I was just there recently, just a couple weeks ago. There's uh, established elderberries, figs, pomegranates, uh, multi-grafted apples, pears that are totally available to the community to harvest. They're sequestering carbon. The entire landscape is designed for water catchment. So all the trails are contour swales that are catching surface water. There's roof water catchment systems that are catching and storing water and irrigating from the land, from the roof and to the landscape. And this is city halls and schools. Yeah, this is a public building. This is uh, uh, exactly. We've put rainwater catchment on the Sebastopol City Hall, the Petaluma City Hall. So it's very exciting to work in that public interface and the way that it affects the community, not only because it's on public land and working with the cities, but also the people who come there, you know, who live in these communities, come and engage in these gardens. In Sebastopol, we did a really interesting one. We designed a cultural history garden around the city hall and library, who are two buildings that are right next door to each other. So it goes through four different eras of West Sonoma County's agricultural history. So we have a garden dedicated to indigenous Pomo and Miwok and that showcases a lot of the plants used by them in their communities. Those are the native tribes of that area? Yeah, those are the native tribes of the area. So there's a whole garden that's um, dedicated to highlight the different sacred plants and edible and medicinal and fiber-based plants for that community. Then we have one that represents more of the agrarian era um, where I live. You know, apples and pears and cherries and grapes are a big deal, big agriculture area. And then uh, Luther Burbank is also from Sebastopol. He's a you know well-known uh, plant breeder, and many of us are still eating plants that he bred today. And so we have a Luther Burbank garden, and then we have one that represents sort of the current day ecological edible forest. So all, so you can go to the city hall and walk through time, connecting with these different ecological gardens that represent different communities. So you learn about the cultural history of the place while tasting the food, smelling the flowers, while being in a garden that is providing ecological yields 
through building soil and catching water and providing habitat. Now, can anybody just go in there and eat the food or how does that work? The food is totally available to the public. So currently with the the maintenance plan that's happening, I'm not sort of up on what the current ma- management system is there because it's been a number of years since we installed it. But all of these public food forests are totally available to the public to, to harvest and eat and relate with. Does that make a dent? Does like that food make a difference? It's like what, one half a day's eating per year or or more than that for your average citizen? It's really hard to quantify because these are fairly small landscapes. So I I think they're a a bit more symbolic. They're not necessarily feeding the community, but they are, the food is available to the community to, to, you know, have a fresh snack on a, on a hot summer day. I think that the bigger effect is that we're shifting the cultural aesthetic of the community. And I I actually think this is probably one of the most important parts of the conversation about how we transform the landscape industry is about aesthetics. Because we have a cultural aesthetic in the Western world, which is very clean, it's very tidy, it's very organized, it's, it's in many cases, it's very English rose garden type uh, of uh, aesthetic. And this, I thought English gardens were more wild and the French ones were more sort of regimented. Now, the English, uh, they're certainly wild English gardens, but they are often in rows and very well maintained and with the box hedges and, and, uh, okay. and such. And, you know, there's a, it's a gradient between very well overly organized and wild. There's a big gradient there. Yeah. But when we talk about ecological function... The more that we are keeping everything so tidy and so perfect and so clean and the, all the plants have a lot of space between them, we really reduce the ecological function, especially when it comes to habitat, when it comes to biodiversity. We reduce biodiversity to make things easier. So having these public gardens is one way of also representing a kind of aesthetic, an edible garden aesthetic with a high biodiversity, with plants that are planted a bit closer together. They're still very beautiful. They're not as wild as my garden by any means, but they do inspire the community to think about how they could function, how they could design and build their landscapes differently. One thing I've been thinking a lot about is the price of food. And food costs, as probably most of your audience knows, are going through the roof. And we have a lemon hedge at our place. We eat lemons every day. And just recently we we ran out finally. We've been had lemons for, you know, 10 months and oh, they're gone. So we go to the store thinking, "Oh, let's go buy a couple of lemons and a dollar 49 for an organic lemon." One lemon. One lemon, a single lemon. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous to think about. So I, so I thought, God, especially we, in California. Yeah. So realizing that, well, we grew over a thousand dollars worth of lemons this year just off a few trees. So when we can break out of the landscape hypnosis that we've been in for uh, you know multiple decades, that landscapes have to be overly clean, that there aren't useful plants there like food, we invite an opportunity to do a number of beneficial actions for the ecology and the community, grow food and save money being at the top of that list, sequestering carbon, catching water, and creating these very diverse habitats for all living things. And all of our landscapes can be that. And I also want to sort of back up for a second look at landscape from a slightly different lens, because I know you have a, um, an agricultural audience here. And when one of the reasons why I named my book The Regenerative Landscaper is not only to acknowledge that this is a massive land use industry, you know, 2020, it was a $105 billion industry in the United States, but also because if we want to regenerate soils and ecosystems and watersheds at a quicker rate, we need to be able to create a, an economy that supports that kind of work. How do we get that work done at scale? Well, one of the easiest ways to find a right livelihood doing regenerative design on any scale is to become a landscape designer. This is a well-trod professional path that's well-respected throughout our culture and has a lot of different inroads. You could be a designer, you could, be in, you could do installation, you can do maintenance, and you bet that through my design company, 
my landscape design company, I'm designing 100 acre farms. I'm working on rotational grazing systems over 200 acres of grassland with mixed forest. And we can do that under our contractor's license and under our landscape design you know, sort of umbrella. So it's a really great way to not only look at landscape, but also agriculture, a different kind of entry into that building of a regenerative economy that has multiple effects. I mean, we've, we've worked with thousands of acres over the last 20 years in all different capacities to bring regenerative design to the forefront of whatever those endeavors were. Now, part of the regenerative economy, you've kind of alluded to with your example of the lemons. It's like when you start growing things, you know, in your yard, and it doesn't matter whether your yard is five acres or an eighth of an acre. My house, little my little house here, you know, <laughs> tiny eighth of an acre, but you can still you can still do things. You start growing food. You start growing medicinal plants. You start growing. I mean, maybe some, maybe you cut down some of your excess wood and you've got some fuel for your wood stove. You're starting to get out of the industrial economy. A hundred percent. I think the, I think COVID really turned a lot of people on to this need to break out of the industrial economy and, and become producers once again. And for instance, during um, the couple of years of COVID, I live on an acre so it's not a huge landscape, but it's good size for a single family. We have over 150 fruit and nut trees on that property. We have thousands of different herbs. That's a lot of trees. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, it's very intensive. It's And like I mentioned before, it's very wild. This is a full ecosystem. That is ultimately the goal of a regenerative landscape is that it's an ecosystem. It's, a, it's self-regulating. It's fecund. It's... It's providing resources 365 days of the year. And we, li- we live in a climate where we can do that. So we have fruit that will you know, we'll design our orchards in such a way where we'll be able to harvest a cultivar. A new cultivar comes on every couple of weeks. So we have apples from August to December because we didn't just choose one variety of apple. We choose right. a, multiple cultivars that harvest at different times of the year. So we're creating su- harvest successions so we can have a maximum amount of food production on any given day of the year. So during COVID, where you don't really want to go out to the store, you're not driving as much, what it did is it enabled us to think about more about value add because often we're too busy. We live busy lives. We have kids and businesses and all that. But what kind of the spark that went off was, oh, now we have more time to can the applesauce, to make the jams, to uh, make the medicinal tinctures. And that opened up a door in our lives that we were just on the cusp of. And I notice this a lot in my community and folks I talk with. And my, my business actually exploded during COVID because so many people were wanted to focus on their landscapes, wanted to build these gardens that were going to provide food and medicine and recreation and stress relief. And our priorities really shifted. And I think that was one of one of blessing was thinking about how do we become producers again? You know, at one point over a hundred years ago, there were, you know, the majority of people in the United States were farmers and producers and moving the needle back towards that will have amazing effects for ecosystems, amazing effects for the global economy, even in the sense that we're not feeding destructive economic systems because we're providing for ourselves. The mental health and sort of sense of integrating into your community effects are equally important, I think. 25 years of working in the landscape, and I can tell you that it's what's happening inside of us that ultimately is the make or break for any project or any inspiration or any goal that we have. So the mental health side, I think, is central to these projects being able to come to fruition, to be successful. And I've seen it way too many times that a project begins and it's too stressful, the planning is too stressful, or it was misplanned to begin with, and it just falls apart. And then all this time and energy and money and energy, went, it went into something that then unraveled in the end. And I talk about this a lot in my book because I really want to empower folks, whether it's just someone building a garden in their backyard or whether it's somebody who wants to become a professional designer or somebody who wants to educate about this. One of the main threads of my book is 
how to be real about this in terms of how do you actually create a project from beginning to end? How do you think about it and be in alignment with the ecosystem when you're building out your project? But also, how do you think about the amount of time that you have? Who are the project stakeholders? Who needs to have decision making? Who do you need to talk to to get on board? What's the budget? How long is this going to take? These are real world questions that are the make or break for projects. And our mental health is at the very center of all of that. So there's that aspect of it. And then there's the aspect of just going out into an abundant ecosystem. That's your, also your backyard and feeling at peace. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just simply being outdoors and having a relationship with non-human living entities, that in itself <laughs> You know, start like for me, it's like start with your dogs and go out from there. <laughs> yeah. And so for, for instance, this year, I mean, over so my I've been at my place for about nine years and the biodiversity, mostly in birds and insects, has increased exponentially every single year. And I have all kinds of amazing stories about the wildlife experiences just on my little one acre. This year, a fox family moved in and they took over they took over underneath one of our elderberry trees. And they lived there for about seven months. And in that time, they almost eradicated gophers from the site during that time. We had usually gophers, you know, the ground burrowing rodents that eat the roots of plants are kind of a big issue. Oh, they're terrible here. They destroy people's gardens. I've seen like plants just sinking into the ground because the gophers underneath are pulling them down. Exactly. That's just classic. I, I like to call it Swiss cheese landscapes when you go out and there's just gopher holes every two or three feet, you know, for uh, for an acre. But there's a lot of ways to approach that. One is to create a system that attracts life and then life takes care of the issue. So we have barn owl, we have red shouldered hawk, we have fox, we have weasel. All of these eat gophers. They are massive gopher control contributors to the system. So while the fox was around, no plant got eaten by a gopher during that time. That's so interesting. When they were around or they did they go away? Yeah, they move on after a while. And actually one of the kits stayed stuck around for an extra month or two. And then she eventually left as well. And they'll probably come back. This is the third year that they've come and built their den there. And but that to live with a fox in that close proximity, it requires a level of sensitivity. That particular area that they took over, we decided, okay, well, we're going to really let, let that be their place. We're not going to run machines right there. We really want them to be around. We want them to feel safe here. And we were able to achieve that for a while. Meanwhile, the kingfisher is fishing out of the pond. The owls are hunting on the land. The weasels are, are rolling through. I mean, it's, it's almost mind-blowing to observe all of the life of the ecosystem in a garden that feels safe, feels at home, and has food to eat. And I think that is one indicator of a successful project is not only plant biodiversity, insect biodiversity, bird biodiversity, but also the biodiversity in the, the mammal world that comes through. The more of this diversity that we have, that's an indicator of a thriving ecosystem. And again, I like to refer to these more as ecosystems than landscapes because people have this image of what a landscape is supposed to be. But can we move from our image of a landscape towards an ecosystem, like the kind that we go hike out to feel the miracles of nature? Can we bring that home? Yeah. Can we bury our home in these kinds of ecosystems while also producing a yield that for, for ourselves in food and medicine? You're listening to Down to Earth. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Kivira Coalition's new agrarian program is accepting applications for the 2024 season from November 1st until December 15th, or once all positions are filled. Apprenticeships take place on working ranches and farms practicing regenerative agriculture across the Intermountain West. These eight-month full-time paid apprenticeships include housing and will allow apprentices to be fully immersed in the work of an operation. Program support includes in-person gatherings, an education stipend, educational Zoom calls, one-on-one -on -one check ins and networking opportunities to kickstart a career in regenerative agriculture. Apprenticeships begin in March and April and run through November 2024. You can learn more at kiviracoalition.org slash new agrarian, and Kivira is Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And now back to our program. So what does it mean when you've got 
a one acre ecosystem that is in a landscape where not everybody else is doing that. It becomes an island of abundance. Yeah, I, you know, I live kind of in a country setting. So all my neighbors are have about an acre, two acres or more. So we're, at least, we're fortunate enough that there's lots of trees and orchards and agriculture around. So animals have corridors they can go through. If you're in a, in a city or a tight suburban area where there's not a lot of corridors, well, you become a haven. And then hopefully you can inspire your neighbor to create a, a hedgerow or some some kind of corridor for wildlife to find its way through. This is one of the devastating impacts of development, which is how ecosystems get broken into patches. Life needs a way to move and migrate through the landscape. And if we patch it into little parks and then it's just concrete and then another little park, it's, well, you see them on the road. You see the road kills and how animals aren't able to have freedom of movement. So that's another goal that we have working with municipalities and counties and governments is to not only think about new development in such a way where we're connecting uh, havens of life together, where it be parks or greenways or agricultural areas in the urban and suburban zones, but new developments are taking this into account. And we're seeing a lot of promising results. I'm working on a project currently that is an agrohood. Do you know this concept? Never heard of it. Agrohood. Oh, it's it's a fabulous next level that combines everything we're talking about, regenerative agriculture, regenerative landscaping in community settings. So an agrohood is basically a neighborhood that is built around a farm. And that farm services the neighborhood by providing food and medicine and recreation and place to wander and all of that. And the community is investing in the farm in some way or another. So for instance, we're working on one in our community where there's a couple hundred new houses being built. And in the middle of that is a, a, a sort of a strip park. And this strip park, which kind of is kind of a big avenue in the middle of this development, and then there'll be this strip park in the middle of the avenue, leads to a 25-acre farm. And we're working, with the, we're working with the owners and the developers to consider... Can we take all the roof water off of the, the buildings, these you know 200 new homes, single-family homes and townhouses, and move it into a slow-moving waterway that goes down the middle of this boulevard? This is millions and millions of gallons of water per year flow through this system to be able to grow edible and native plants along that and create trails and pathways for people in the neighborhood to walk. And then it leads to a 25-acre farm where that water goes into a large retention pond. And the farm itself is nut orchards and olive orchards and vegetables and animal integration. And now the community, and and this is happening, and the community can go and get food directly from the farm for their neighborhood. It's essentially being watered by their above ground wells, which are their roofs. I love that term. (laughs) Above ground well to refer to your roof. (laughs) Exactly. Right. Sometimes we just have to shift the language a little bit and the lens, you know, something clicks. And so you've got all these above ground wells that are running tens of thousands of gallons of water off every year. So this is a, a really wonderful new way of development where you create not just a park, but a farm which functions as a park but is growing food locally to the people who live right there in the neighborhood. Um, This particular one will also be a place for cultural events, weddings, bar mitzvahs, quinceaneras. Um, There'll be a wood-fired oven, so you can have potluck days, you know, wood pizza days. Um, So it's really become a cultural center in the middle of a neighborhood. And and this is really harkens back to an old way of living where you have a plaza, that has all these kinds of functions and everybody in the community can engage in that. And that there, there used to be a real smart way of building, designing communities to build community and to share resources and to do it in a way that is in sync with the landscape is just another level. So we're seeing this all over. We're seeing this all over the country. Agrihoods are popping up everywhere at different scales. And I think it's, it's very inspiring and it, and it pulls together all of the threads of solutions that are in our quiver to enact positive change on the land. The basic principles of regenerative agriculture and regenerative landscaping are common to all different kinds of landscapes, and that has to do with catching and storing water, 
feeding the food web, feeding healthy soil, capturing carbon, the sort of Boy Scout thing of leaving, leaving it better than you found it, you know, leaving the site better than you found it. That said, it's really different from one landscape to another, one town to another, one like what you are able to do in Sonoma County, California is really different from what we might do. Like if I were to try to do something in my own yard here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where we get so much less water, how do you, you know, how do you know what to do? I mean, the the process of, you know, you, somebody, okay, somebody goes to Collected Works Bookstore here in Santa Fe, where, where you were speaking last night as of this recording, buys your book, The Regenerative Landscaper, and then they go home. It's like, holy, holy moly, what do I do? What do I do here? Can I do this myself? Do I need somebody to do it for me? Do I need handholding? Like, how do you, how do you work with people? The first step is everyone to kind of figure out what their skill set is and their inspiration and their ability. You know, do you have a physical, the physical ability to do the work of transforming your landscape into ecological paradise? Um, so what this comes down to is context. And I think that's what you're kind of speaking to is context. And context means a lot of things. Every ecosystem has its own context. But within an ecosystem, you have a variety of microclimates. You have what's on the ridge versus what's in the valley versus what's in the canyon. Um, you have a south-facing slope versus a north-facing slope orientation. So every site has its own story. And every site has its own context. That is the place to start. And every person has their own context. Some people want to build these ecological gardens, but they work 80 hours a week um, in their career. They don't have time to do it. Or raising small kids and don't have time to do it. Some folks have a ton of time and energy and strength and, can, and will want to do everything themselves. DIY, everything ourselves. So it's beautiful. We live in a diverse world. And the first factor is to figure out the context of the site and the context of people. When I work with clients, I'm not just looking at the landscape parameters, you know, how much water falls here every year, what's the pre precipitation like, soil, plants, but I'm also looking at the client and who they are, what their needs are, what turns them on. People need to feel excited about what they're doing. And a lot of people will turn to regenerative design because they feel like it's the right thing to do because they're worried about the world. And that's one way of entering in. But another one might be someone is a cook and they want to have incredible food to, to, to be able to cook for their family. So part of my assessment process is always assessing, you know, where are people coming from? What gives them joy? And can we design a regenerative landscape that meets them where they're at, that, that really nourishes their hobbies, their excitements, that really gives them joy? So you can design an amazing regenerative landscape a thousand different ways and still achieve building carbon and feeding the life in the soil and catching water. And you can still achieve all these ecological goals, but it might look very, very different depending on who the person is and what the site is. So that's the same everywhere in the world. I would have that same approach no matter what. That would be the very beginning. What is the story of this place? What is the story of these people? Once you have a good understanding of that context, now you can start to make decisions. And when we think about water, the solutions here in Santa Fe aren't actually that different than our solutions in Sonoma County, even though we get a significant amount more water. We also get a lot of flood. Well, I would imagine in a high desert, there's a flooding issue as well. When a big monsoon comes and if you're in a lowland area and all the water's flowing through, you know, 90 plus percent of the water isn't being captured and it flows through and it's going to create devastation, erosion and things like that. So the difference here would be that you might actually plant, you know, in basins more and, and the, your entire garden might be designed in a set of basins because you're not going to have the same kind of soil saturation that we would have in Sonoma County. Once, once winter hits, the soil gets saturated. Uh, now we have an issue where certain trees and plants will rot, rot out at their roots. So we have to raise plants up out of the wet areas while still using the same kind of strategies that you would use here, check dams, rain gardens, ponds, things like that, that w to manage water. The goal of an ecological system is in most cases to capture as much water as is safe and as possible, every drop you can in the landscape. 
And any water that leaves the land is doing so after being filtered. You know, it's not leaving it with sediment and pollution and things like that. So these are principles that are really kind of across the board. And then we adjust and tweak them depending on the particular context. The other one that we use a lot in permaculture, and folks who are familiar with permaculture would know this already, which is through the design process, we, we try to place elements that require the most maintenance closest to the house. What that enables is because we're managing human energy. And of course, you know, back to what's the, what's the make or break for a lot of projects is people, <laughs> how people feel, people's budgets, their mental health, and the energy they have to actually manage and relate to a space. So we would almost always put the things that, you know, vegetables and strawberries and things that you would want to harvest every day right close to the house to make a connection and relationship easy to facilitate that. I would do that in almost every context. So those are some of the ways I would approach it. And then beyond that, if we want to go back a bit further, and I think we should, and I, I encourage people to do this, is to really get in touch with what indigenous folks have done and are currently doing in your ecosystem. Where I live in Sonoma County, we live in oak, there's oak woodlands everywhere, but almost nobody eats the acorns. But this was the foundation for sustenance for the people living there for thousands of years. And we think about, we need to grow all these other foods. We live in a food forest that's surrounded by acorns, but surrounded by oaks. So the more we can honor indigenous ways and learn about how ecosystems, you know, almost every ecosystem on earth evolved with human interaction. So even when you go out into a, a, a place that we might call wild, actually these were tended landscapes, whether it was cultural fire that was introduced or other forms of stewardship that were introduced that for the most part, many places in the world have been cultivated and stewarded by people. And thousands of years of wisdom isn't something to just throw out, you know, to tune into that can really inspire our way forward. I think it's a profound reframing that you're doing when you say that, because part of the ecological movement in certainly in my lifetime has been about how terrible we human beings are. And if you look at the last 200 years of just human impact, you know, colonial human impact on North America, it's absolutely devastating. And you can't help but feel horror, shame and nausea when you when you behold it. At the same time, the idea that that human beings not only can be but are a really positive, beneficial aspect of the landscape, of community, of ecosystems, that's a really important thing to do because otherwise we're just kind of self-hating and paralyzed beings. Yeah, and how helpful is that? Yeah. When we just look at each other and say, we're so horrible, we're we so suck, terrible. Yeah. We did all these t horrible, terrible things and we shouldn't even be here on earth and the earth will be better without us. You know, I hear that kind of thing a lot. Totally. And it's sad. And I think that that is in many ways a result of a break from old traditional ways of being on the land. Especially here in the United States, we have a lot of Euro descendant folks who lost their traditional cultures when they came here, created this new extractive sort of way of being on the land and forgot the old ways that all of us come from people who lived in ecological reciprocal relationship with the land for thousands of years. Every one of our ancestral lineages will, will have that if you go back far enough. So here we are, we're broken from tradition. Nobody taught us how to live in reverence of the land. So what do we do? We destroy it. And I think I, I, I say the word reverence very specifically and emphatically because if we want to claim who we are as a species in terms of what's possible, the healing that we can bring to landscape, the healing that we can bring to each other, reverence is going to be at the core of that. You have to have enough love for the land to not want to destroy it, to, to make decisions that honor ecological beings. And if we can't teach reverence to our children and to each other, reverence for, for nature, teaching reverence for nature is teaching reverence for each other, reverence for ourselves. I and mean, this is a, this is a seed that can lead to thriving in future generations if we choose to plant that seed of reverence 
we could create thriving for future generations. And all old cultures have this. That's why the three main principles I speak about in my book, you know, the first one is reciprocity. Because all old cultures and indigenous cultures here in the U.S. for sure operate through a system of reciprocity that we give to the land. We're gonna, we know we're going to take from the land because we are the land and we need to be sustained by food, water, medicine. But in that process of receiving the yield that we are giving more than we take. And if we could approach regenerative design and landscaping and farming from an approach of we give more than we take, this completely shifts the narrative of what humans can be on earth because we can be inherently regenerative and we can steward ecosystem in a way that builds soil, catches water, grows food, enhances habitat, increases biodiversity. I often think about all these uh, cities that we've built and all these roads that we've built and you know, we, we're living in the six maths extinction event and so many species have died out and, and plant species have disappeared. And sometimes I think about, well, I wonder if we hid something from ourselves. If, if underneath all the asphalt and concrete are the seeds that were lost. And when we wake up to our power as healers on earth and we break up the concrete, then a lot of these lost species might actually return. Well, I was just at the Regenerate Conference here in Santa Fe, and there were people talking about seeds, you know, dormant seeds that might be dormant for 75 years, and then they start regenerating their farm, and all these native perennial seeds start coming up again, or, or whatever the landscape is. Exactly. and But go it's even more profound than that. In Egypt, they found seeds that were 2,000 years old. Did they grow them? That were viable, Yeah. that they could grow. Wow. So we don't know what we've hidden from ourselves, Yeah. not only under the concrete and asphalt, but also in the ecosystems and the way they're being mismanaged now. And so like you're saying, when we start to come back into an alignment with ecosystem management, we're going to see species return again. And this is, this is our, we could change the narrative of humanity on earth by applying the principles of regeneration. And I, the world can be seem so stark and so hopeless sometimes and you watch the news and it feels very hopeless. But those of us who are constantly engaging in this partnership with ecosystem can't help but feel the belief that we can achieve great things. We can heal so many problems of the world on the land, in with yeah. the soil, in partnership, because we see it happen every day in the garden. You know, in my little garden, I see it happen, let alone on a big regenerative farm where we're seeing it happen across thousands of acres. I mean, the nefarious forces of extractive evil have a lot of power, and they have a lot of land, and they have a lot of money, and they've got a lot of machines. And the process by which that whole thing comes to an end is not known to me or you or anybody but the fact that it will eventually come to an end because it is so very unsustainable is something that we can rely on and the way I see the work that you're doing and so many other regenerative farmers and ranchers and so on is they're doing it now and then when the other thing kind of falls apart it's like oh look those guys are doing it let's do what they're doing Precisely. And we're already seeing it happen at different scales all around the world. The tracking of regenerative projects around the world and tracking kind of like the positive line of, of action is so hard to do. There are tens of thousands of campesinos in Latin America and Africa who are doing this work, healing villages, healing landscapes, restoring watersheds, growing food, reducing erosion, we're never going to hear those stories. Yeah, there's only so many documentaries you can make. Yeah, yeah, we're never going to hear those stories. And so I always like to say there's always that mystery of all these amazing people around the world doing the right thing that at a certain point, this is going to crest and start to shift things. And you're right, the powers that control food and seed and agriculture and water and economy, they seem insurmountable. But I think that folks don't realize how much power we have. And this is why I like to go back to this idea of landscape and back to this reminder that there's 40 million acres of lawn in the United States. 
those lawns aren't corporate ag owned. They're right. owned by us. Right. We own those lawns, right? Or your landlord or whoever, you know, even if you're renting, it's like we have power over land, whether you own it or not. You walk into a park, you you walk down the, your neighborhood street and you look at the parking medium. Most people look at this, these little patches of land as kind of useless. Oh, it's kind of too little small. I can't really grow food there. It's not, it's not a big agriculture system where we think we can make all the biggest impact. But the truth is we need to work where we are because if we want to live in alignment with ecosystem, then we need to work where we are because that has the most ecological benefits. And if working where you are means cultivating the parking strip at your school or working with your neighbors to grow a, a collective garden together. I mean, I've seen it happen. You don't have to own land to do this. And I think this is a, I have a big section of my book about this because I spent decades not owning land, but building gardens, hundreds and hundreds of gardens that we've built on other people's land. And every fruit tree that you plant, every native garden that you put in, has an effect. It has a benefit. And all this kind of adds up over time so that in the wake of my life are thousands of acres of regenerated landscape, very few of which I ever owned or right. even That's had right. the decision-making power, you know? So I think that we're more powerful than we realize. And if we can make decisions to cultivate our neighborhoods first, you know, our, our lands, if we have them or not, our neighborhoods, work with our neighbors, our schools, our parks, our city halls, our libraries, this just becomes a growing you know, seed that's planted in, in your neighborhood, in your community that can grow to something very, very powerful. And we've seen it in different places around the country where a seed of this idea was started and 20, 30 years later... There's edible forest gardens in every neighborhood, parks, schools, and, and it grows and grows and grows. Eric Olson is author of the book The Regenerative Landscaper, published by Synergetic Press. To find out more about Eric's work, you can go to permacultureartisans.com. And if by any chance you're in New Mexico in the Santa Fe area, you can pick up this book at Collected Works Bookstore. Thank you so much for being with us on Down to Earth. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate, where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.